Hello, hello, it's me, and it's you, my little gripling. What am I drawing today? Today I'm drawing a character named Ashlyn, who is one of my characters. So, something that no one should really care that much about, but I made her. I made her! Um, this is a old character from 2017. Oh, it's been so... Oh. It feels like something I just did, and it's been that long. Now that I remember it. It's been six years. That's amazing. Alright, so this is going to be a follow-up to a lot of different things. It's going to require some explanation. First off, though, I am incredibly tired. I did most of this yesterday. This was a ten-hour long drawing. So, yesterday I did basically absolutely nothing besides this. From whenever I woke up to whenever I went to sleep. The only thing I actually did was I stopped to eat, and I uh, played Conan Exiles for like two or so hours or something with the misses, and that's pretty much it. Um, so I'm incredibly exhausted. Uh, whenever I say that these drawings take about, you know... 7 to 15 hours or so. You don't do that all in one sitting. You're not supposed to. I know there's the whole idea that you should take breaks while you're working, and they always say that they, you know, quote-unquote they, always say that they you should take breaks like every 15 minutes or so, to which I say, that is insane. That you are just getting up and down over and over again every 15-20 minutes. No, no, no. That's completely unrealistic. However, I have a bad habit of having my breaks be something like every two hours, every three or four hours. It depends. So I don't treat myself well whenever I make these things. Because I get really, really locked into doing them. Uh, that is a bad habit of mine. If I find that... If I decide that I'm going to do something, then I have a habit of hyper-fixating on it until it's done. And if you try to interrupt me, like, hey, 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 wait, 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 there's this other thing that needs to get done. It's like you're shaking me out of sleepwalking. It's extremely hard to get me out of it. <laughs> so, uh, it, maybe it's a temporary form of insanity, I don't know. Um, but anyways, just... To let you know, I am in a blah mode right now, so my commentary is going to be shaky. So, um, the, re the reason why I was trying to rush is I'm trying to get this done before my birthday, which is, actually, it's probably going to release on my birthday tomorrow. Um, I'm recording this on the 26th, I think. So yeah, it should be out tomorrow or later today. I might actually get it out before. Yeah, 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 I should be able to get it out later today. That makes me slightly pleased with myself. I beat my own um, internal little, um, whatever it's called, schedule, schedule. Wow, that's bad today. All right, so forget all that. Why am I doing this in the first place? Well, one, I've gotten tired of just drawing Zelda characters and so forth and so on. It was nice just to be able to draw something that was mine. Um... I wanted to do something that was not a short. Uh, I've been doing a lot of shorts lately. They've been doing fairly okay. Not, like, astonishing. Uh, I've been having a little shorts experiment and trying to make things for the new generation people that want to watch everything on the commode and don't have attention spans at all. Uh, and you can already see that I've gone through, like, a bunch of iterations of the layout by now. Uh, this is, like, the third or fourth one by now and it's not going to be the last one it takes me a long time to get this going because the thing that I'm trying to do here is uh, come up with a more interesting layout that still fits the 16-9 uh, layout ratio and not many things can do that while also fitting the entire body on the page so if I do what I'm doing here and it stretches out the body, then you end up with a very tiny drawing that's not very interesting to look at. 
And here we go. This is like the start of what I end up uh, finishing on. <laughs> what I finish on. Sorry. Um, yeah, you need a lot of creative approaches to try to resolve layout issues like this or composition issues. Okay, so I've been doing a lot of shorts and they've been doing fine. Making a little bit of money. This the main thing. Like, now that I'm getting older, like, making... 25k a year is not what it used to be. So I'm trying to find um, more revenue streams. So unfortunately, my very old Patreon idea of once I make $1,500 a month, I'm going to turn off ads on YouTube to show YouTube what's boss. That was back whenever I was so incredibly poor that the most money I'd ever made in one year, I think, was like $9,000 or something. Like, it was really bad. Uh, so I was just extremely happy to be able to exist as a human being. Uh, so the idea of actually requiring money to do anything had never entered my mind. Because I was just happy to be able to eat. Uh, YouTube changed my life in a lot of ways. Um, so now I'm trying to change myself in other ways. And actually be a human being and have like career advancements and try to embitter my life. Is that a word? Embitter? Embiggen. I'm trying to embiggen my life to be the biggest. So to that end, I've been trying to figure out different ways of doing that. Uh, I was trying to stream, but you guys know my internet connection. It just doesn't want to work. Um, I've been trying to get in this entire area. It doesn't matter where you actually move to. Um, in this entire area, there's not really any fiber options necessarily. Uh, you can go to certain places, but those have their own problems. And the main provider of it has been fighting local legislation from the state, not local, you, you know, has been fighting state legislation because the it's actually a company that is in another state uh, for several years. So even though I've been waiting on internet that I signed up for back in, like, whenever this character was originated, like, I think like 2016, I've just been waiting around on it for almost a decade now. So, no internet streaming. Because whenever I fire it up to see, can I stream today, I have 90% packet loss or something of that nature. And if you don't know what that means, you're supposed to have 0% packet loss. And if you ever even have 1% packet loss, that is something you should be really concerned about. Because the internet is not supposed to drop packets. But mine does. And it does it a lot. Because it is an overachiever. Therefore, I cannot stream, because whenever you send internet packets, which are little messages containing the information that lets people see what you're doing, you know, it's the video, it's the audio, it's everything. If it loses the packets, then nothing appears on the screen, so you cannot stream. Uh, you have what are called late packets, where they eventually get there, but you have to keep resending the same package over and over and over again. But you can't just keep doing that forever. So I basically have to wait until I get fiber. And even once, like, whenever I actually get it, it's not as though I'm going to be streaming every day. I imagine it will probably be similar to what it is now in the sense of I'm going to be focusing on doing other things. I'm just, I'm, I'm a man of too many hats when it comes to making my own content. Some people are able to just do nothing but make you know, Let's Plays, I can't do that. Some people are able to do nothing but uh, stream content, I can't do that either. The money and the viewership just isn't there. Uh, that's not really what my content is known for. Some people are able to do nothing but commissions, and I don't want to do that, I will go insane. Because I've already done that once, and I know from experience that the money also is not quite there. Unless I want to do furry porn, I guess. 
So unfortunately with me, it comes down to, I need to do a lot of different things, a lot of them. And that's what kills me because I have to be able to make these things, I have to be able to stream. I have to be able to do the reward stuff. I have to be able to do my little side projects, which is what this is about. Um, and sort of micromanage the little internal projects as well. So, you know, the video essays, uh, the videos that I was hoping to release, it doesn't seem like those are going to be coming out anytime soon. Uh, so I had a Hunter Hunter video that I had planned. I don't think that's going to be coming out anytime soon. I might have to find another uh, video editor for that one. I'm not quite sure. Um, the Dead by Daylight video that should have been out sometime Sometime uh, around this m month, last year, is still not here. Although, uh, the majority of that is my fault. Um, it's another editor problem. So I just have a lot of things to worry about. <sighs> and in the process, I am extremely glad that I'm able to just ramble about this. In sort of a podcast format. Because in making the shorts, even though they're much easier to make and much shorter, it does get very tiring any time I have to record having to worry about getting everything perfect. Because whenever I make the shorts, I have to try to condense everything into as small a package as possible. It has to be exactly one minute. Like, it can't be 45 seconds and then have, you know, 15 seconds of me just not talking. It can't be a minute and one second because then it goes over and then you don't hear that last second of what I said. It has to be perfect. So in the process of writing, I have to not only get the character limit just right, which I have to eyeball, but I also have to, in the process of uh, uh, reading it, get all the enunciation perfect because I'm doing it for a general audience and I'm you know just trying to get it done. Uh, so... Instead of, like, sort of just talking at you like I am now, I have to talk more like this. And I have to get every word perfect. And I have to speak it in the most precise way possible. And I have to do it in a very natural way. So I, it can't even sound like that. Like, that is an example of something I would retake. Ugh. So just, I'm, I'm very tired of doing different things. All that to say... If you're questioning why the hell is he rambling about this, he was going to talk about what the ghost is for. Yes. What I have been doing, if you guys remember this, I had an idea a long time ago, which I'm, I realized the other day that was a long time ago, even though it feels like something that I was talking about literally probably like five or six months ago. It probably was like three years ago at this point. I don't remember. I was talking about the idea of making a video game which I had been working on off and on. My idea was to get Unity and to make a very, very simple idea for a video game that was sort of, um, sort of similar to Observation Duty or Spectator or Phasmophobia. Like, that's the layout of my game. Uh, Phasmophobia and Observation Duty don't really have too much in common, aside from the fact that they are, like, ghosty games. That's pretty much it. Phasmophobia, you physically, in third person, or first person, excuse me, uh, go into a house and look around for a ghost, and a ghost will haunt you and chase you with its little grabby, dirty mitts, and will grab you and shake you and be like, get out of my house. Go on, skip. And then you'll die. Because the ghost overdoes it. And it's an American ghost. So, you know, you know this is what happens. You shouldn't have been uh, playing with that ball on the ghost's lawn. Because it's America. Uh, anyways. <laughs> um, uh, whereas Observation Duty is a game... I've played this on stream before. It's a game where you effectively are doing that game as a kid of what's different in the picture. But the ghost is doing something different. So you look at a room, and then you switch cameras between rooms to try to catch the ghost in the act. And sometimes you'll see it do it, but usually not. 
uh, but like a mug will slide across the table. And then you have to go, ah, I remember that mug was exactly half a meter to the left. And then you uh, report back to someone. <laughs> I'm not sure. Her, uh, some other team somewhere. And go, hey, something moved in this room. Or you just guess. You don't actually see anything. And you're like, something changed somewhere. So you go, uh, something moved in the kitchen. And then a team goes in there and goes, did something move? Uh, yeah, it did, it turns out. And they won't tell you what it was, but something moved. And then it'll correct. And then if you get enough of those wrong, like in a time frame, if enough of those build up and you get enough of them, like if you don't see enough of them, there we go. Uh, if you don't see enough of them and they build up, then you lose. Okay, so that's the premise of those games. My idea, I've been doing sort of a little mini design document for it. Uh, I was also trying to learn Unity. But I just... Like I said, I have too many hats. I don't have the time. And that's one of the things I've had to slowly admit to myself. I keep having these ideas of what if I... Like the Scary Lessons thing. Remember Scary Lessons? Th this is what this girl's from, effectively. Scary Lessons. There was another game I was going to try to make. I was going to try to do a visual novel because I got the idea sort of from like a Doki Doki Literature Club that maybe I could just do something very quickly. It just... It, it takes too long. There's just too much effort that goes into it. And I knew that going into it, but I figured, well, maybe if I just took like three or four months, then I could get it done. And that's part of why I had like that huge breakdown like a, a couple of years ago. Um, because I had wasted too much time in the development of the Star Wars animation that never came out that had like um, all the voice actors in it. I still have all the, the raw stuff. I just it's a 15 minute long animation. I just don't have the time. I'm going to lose my mind trying to make it. Uh, so I was developing that. I had the game going on at the same time. I was trying to uh, figure that out. So I was writing a script for it. So every single thing that I was doing just required so much energy that I would have had whenever I was much younger. And that's part of the reason why I was taking on all these things, because I was thinking, well, you know, I still have the mentality that I had whenever I was uh, uh, back in, like, my teenage years, my 20s. Like, I was able to write a novel back whenever I was in my late 20s, early 30s, because I still had the time, the free time and the energy, and there were no expectations for what I would be doing with my free time. Uh, so I was like working a day job and also writing on the side and also doing the gauge web comic at the same time. Um, and I didn't really have to worry about anything else. Whereas now all my free time has to go into like doing my actual uh, job, which is working for myself. So there's only so much that can be done. But I eventually reached the point where I realized I'm ruining my own life. Because I'm, I need to get this animation done. There's no way that I can. Because I'm one person and it's 15 minutes long. And I'm nowhere near being done yet. I need to get the game done. And there's no way that I can. Because in addition to writing it, which I'm in the, still in the process of doing, I have to learn how to do it and then do it myself. And I can't do that either. And that, in addition to a bunch of life things and COVID happening, just everything was going wrong. Just absolutely everything went wrong. Um, so, flash forward to today, I still have sort of the same problem in the sense of I'm, I had to scale back that idea of I can't do scary lessons. I can't write an entire novel and then reformat it into a video game and then troubleshoot the video game and learn how to make it. I can't do those things. I would need an actual team, and I don't have... Like, this is part of my problem. I don't have the money to pay someone 
And I also, even if I did, I don't really have the experience to be able to know how to go about doing it. Like, uh, imagine if I had like a, just a million dollars sitting in a pile right here, and I could pay someone to make a video game. I wouldn't know how to go about doing it in the sense of, I guess I would like have to, uh, I guess I would like have to get a lawyer to be able to, not litigate, but uh, to be able to explore exactly how I should go about paying someone and hiring someone and being able to handle the licensing of it and things like that. Um, so with this game that I'm hopefully about to talk about soon, um, I would have to actually bring someone on and go, all right, here's my design document. Here's what I actually need to have happen. I'm going to pay you to make it. I don't know how that works because let's say it gets made and he gives me the game and it just shows up in a little present and it's that simple. Like it's just an executable and he goes, this is the game. What do I do then? Like if I wanted to list it on Steam, that's something else I would have to research. If it's... Uh, even if I did that, I would have to figure out, well, how do I pay the guy that actually made the thing? Because that's another problem. Like, I'm not the one that made it at that point. Yes, I had the idea, and I'm sure I would be putting forth a lot of effort in actually making the thing. Um, but I'm not the one actually doing the quote-unquote labor, which is something I'm not used to. That's something I'm used to. I've always taken care of myself and done my own work. Uh, so the idea of having someone else do something is just so foreign to me. Um, but in other words, it's, it's a lot of like things that you don't think about that you would have to start worrying about. Like if you yourself were doing this, then... Uh, you would also have to start worrying about these things. And it's not as simple as, well, I'll figure it out. Because that's always been my mentality. You know, since that's how I've always done things, I just figure it out eventually. But that requires time and it requires youthful energy, I guess. <laughs> okay, so. The idea that I had for my game is sort of a combination of those two things in the sense of you're still looking through a security camera. And you're still trying to determine how things are changing, but a lot of them are are actually overt. They're not like a observation duty or a spectator where you are squinting and you're not quite sure what happened most of the time. Um, I've already gotten through much of the design document because it's really not that complicated of a game. Uh, that's the reason why I decided to go from like scary lessons to this, because this in theory is extremely simple to do. And if someone actually, like if I knew how to use unity, I could probably do this in like a weekend. Like it's actually very simple. I think, although this is a writing problem. As soon as I started writing it out, the more complicated it got. Um, I was trying to explain this to Maria, um, the other day that in the process of writing or teaching, like teaching is one of the best tools to learning because you learn how little you know in the process of actually trying to teach. For example, um, I know a lot about drawing, for example, but if I try to just explain the process of drawing to someone, uh, it would get kind of complicated very quickly. And I would realize how many things that I'm just saying without realizing that they require more explanation that I'm giving it. Like, it warrants more information. Uh, I was trying to explain this to her. I'll try to explain it to you. But there's a lot of mental shortcuts that you have in your head that you never really think about. Like, you might consider for yourself... Um, I'm trying to think of a good, ex uh, good example. <sighs> but just in the process of thinking about things you can mentally reach an internal conclusion without actually thinking about it in terms of words. Like, you're not actually thinking in the same way that you would be talking. They're just things that you know. Um, so whenever you someone questions you about it, 
and then you actually have to explain it to them with words, you'll start to stumble. Because you'll realize at that moment, oh, I'm reaching the right conclusion in my head, but I'm so used to just knowing that information that I've never had to like explain it to myself. And because I've never had to explain it to myself, I don't know how to structure that information in a way that I can deliver it to someone. Does that make sense? I hope it does, because I have no way of listening to see if you're saying no. <laughs> um, but there are things like that. Uh, so the process of teaching is that problem of then trying to parse your internal knowledge in such a way that you can deliver it. And whenever you're designing a game, it's sort of like that as well, where you have this image of something in your head, and it seems very simple. And to be fair, it actually was. I just it sort of intentionally made it more complicated because I thought I could get away with it. <laughs> um, but in the process of doing it, I was, I've, I've been doing that. Uh, I'm making the game more complicated than it needs to be, I guess. Uh, but anyways... Right now, it is somewhat simple. There is... The the idea, effectively, is not that you're doing the matching game, although that's part of it. It is that you are... I've been listening to uh, Mindhunter recently, uh, which is the book that the Netflix show Mindhunter was based off of, which is the... A story about how the FBI developed its modern understanding of criminal profiling. And I have basically taken that sort of idea and put it into the ghost game. So the idea is that it's sort of a ghost profiler. Where whenever something happens, uh, the cup slides across the table, that sort of thing. You don't fix it. You're not there to fix anything. What you do is you just observe it and log it and see, oh, this happened, and it happened in this way. And then you try to take all the things that you see, the cup sliding across the ground, the necklace lifting into the, the air, the message that's left on a notepad, um, blood on the walls, that sort of thing. This ghosty stuff, right? You try to take all that information and then construct sort of a narrative behind it. And you can see how now the game becomes complicated. Uh, but basically it's sort of a matching game of different elements so that you can figure out the general idea behind what the ghost is and what it may have wanted or what caused it to exist in the first place. So that's how it's sort of like Phasmophobia. Because in Phasmophobia, that's sort of what you're doing as well. You're going into the house, and then the ghost, you know, hunts at a cer certain frequency. And by the way, when I'm choosing colors here, I can never quite... Whenever I did the Scary Lessons comic, I took the black and white version of that character, and then I applied color to it, and she was sort of very purple, very dark. Uh... Her hood was black. Most of the rest of her, her colors uh, were also like very dark. Her skin was light in tone, but that was it. And her hair was black as well. Uh, I sort of like the idea of her being completely white because she's supposed to be a sheet ghost. Like literally like bed sheets, like holes in the bed sheet. That's what she is. Uh, that's the idea. Uh, so I try to make her as white as possible. But uh, she doesn't look quite what I would like her to be if she's completely white. It's interesting having her have all white hair. But I kind of prefer her to have black hair. But maybe it's just because I like black hair. So you guys tell me what you think as far as like color schemes go. Uh, but that's just me. Anyways. So in Phasmophobia, yes, you go into the house. Things happen. Uh, you see footprints and salts. You... Uh, see how what the temperature is like, if it's getting very cold or not. And then you just try to match up all those things to your journal that tells you if you see the following three things together, that means it's this kind of ghost. You know, that's what phasmophobia is. So it's sort of 
an intersection of all those ideas. So the gameplay in this theoretical game is like that, in the sense of you have tiers of changes. Like uh, the light, the lights get a little bit darker or a little bit lighter, but it's almost imperceptible. It's kind of hard to notice. And then that sort of ramps up to tier two, where the change gets a little bit more dramatic, but then it just stops. Instead of going... Th this is something that's different from uh, the games I was talking about. And those games, it'd be more like just a dramatic change that happens very suddenly. Like a painting moves from one side of the wall to the other. Whereas in this one, I would like it to be more subtle in the sense of uh, the painting might shift a little bit left and right. But it happen it does happen sort of suddenly or just very, very slightly to the point where your eye might not even notice it if you're not looking directly at it. And then it ramps up and then it shifts more dramatically, but it happens once. It doesn't go back to what it was. And then it just remains that way for the rest of the, the game. So that would be Tier 2, where the, it, it ramps up and it's suddenly uh, something else. Uh, tier 3 would be more of the typical things that happen, where they're more dramatic. Like, I think, what did I write down? Uh, large objects appearing, writing appearing on walls, computers or on notepads, uh, temperature changes, light bulbs going completely out, candles just appearing, ghostly figures vanishing whenever you first see them, like you, you just briefly see them and then they're gone, that sort of thing. Um, objects being visible, but only under infrared or ultraviolet, that sort of thing, like different camera modes. And tier four would be Things that are like right in your face, like very ominous changes that let you know that things are getting uh, more intense. So, like humanoid figures appearing, or entire rooms like catching on fire, or uh, like a dead body just showing up, or books literally flying around the room, or... Um, like your actual camera position changing radically or just everything just going back to normal suddenly. That sort of thing. And tier 5 would be basically you die, like time starts to run out. And um, the idea is, while even some of the, while some of the ghosts are not hostile, eventually what is happening will become dangerous to the player if you don't do it quickly. So you... Have to solve it before the time runs out, and if you try to solve what the ghost is, and you guess incorrectly, that lowers the amount of time that you have. And if uh, you do that, like, I think twice, maybe three times, it depends on the what ends up feeling right, then uh, if you do it incorrectly enough times, then you also lose. <clears throat> and so... I had to come up with how exactly the player would be logging this information. So I figured I'm going to need like two different categories minimum, maybe three. And as soon as I started listing them, I realized, no, two is enough. Um, so I came up with what the, the entity or the whatever the anomalies uh, temperament is, if it has one. And <coughs> excuse me. And it's nature. So, in other words, like what its emotional state is and what it looks like or what it is. So its temperament would be whether it's angry, confused, sad, fearful, uh, caring, or it doesn't have one. And you can tell from that based on what it's doing. So, if the cup slides across the table, that example, and it does so very gently then that might indicate that it is either more placid or that it's, you know, sad or something like that. Whereas if it happens very suddenly, then you can determine, well, it's probably more upset. It's like angry or it's confused. Like it's not a definitive thing, but you can probably gather some intelligence that way. Um, if you can track the ghost and what it's doing, uh, like if it's, you can physically see under, um, infrared or, um, ultraviolet 
that it's leaving footprints. And you can say, see that it's going around the house, like the entire house. But it's moving erratically, like it keeps doubling back to the places that it's already been. Then you can go, oh, well, it's probably a confused temperament ghost of some sort. Or if it's like seemingly going to places that would require searching, you know, you could look at it that way. Or if it's like very quickly running around, then you could say that it's either angry or it's fearful. You know, it just depends. These are all like context things. Uh, it will require you to sort of, you know, piece together a narrative in your mind of what may be, have been happening. Um, so that's temperament. You, you get the idea. I'm not going to go over every single one of them. I'm trying to do this for time. Uh, that's the general idea of how that works. Its nature is like whether it is... I wrote down several of these. Uh, tangible, which means that it has like a human-like form. You know, it just looks like a person. Uh, and you might even be able to physically touch it. And then you have intangible, which are sort of the same thing, but they're more vaguely humanoid. So they... You can look at them, but you can't actually touch them, and they may not have all their limbs, or they're more, like, ghostly looking, like, stereotypically so. Uh, so they're a little kind of shaky, smoky. Uh, then you have incorporeal, which are literally, like, you know, a ball of light, or it's fluid on the ground, or it's smoke in the air. Like, it has no form at all, practically. And if it does, it's something that isn't humanoid. Then you have vessels which would be possessions. So like a ghost that you can see in the sense of it has possessed either a person or an animal or like an object of some sort. And then illusory, which would be things that can look like anything, but they only appear to a person. They never show up in recorded media. So if someone points at a ghost and goes, look, a ghost... And then you go, there's you know, there's nothing there. There's no ghost. And they go, no, 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 it is. You can take a picture of it and show them there's literally nothing there. It's just in your head. That's an illusory ghost. And then I had to come up with a word. I made up a word for this one. Intervisible. Which is... This shouldn't require too much explanation. But it's sort of the inverse of that in the sense of... It can appear in recordings and photographs and paintings, anything that is a recording of the real life, <laughs> the real life, the real life, that's a recording of real life, uh, but it never actually shows up to people. You can't, and it doesn't really exist. So it, you can never touch it. It never affects anything in the real world that you can see. Uh... So, like, a, a good example of that, probably the most famous, would probably be, like, Slenderman, I guess. Because the original concept behind that was, here are some old photographs that we all took of, like, our family vacations and so forth and so on. Wait, who's that thing in the background? There's a man in a uh, uh, business suit that's always following us around. That's weird. And he's in my photograph, too. That would be an intervisible creature. Where it's... Never visible unless you were to take a photo of that area. And then it might show up in the photo or the video. But it's not visible to the naked eye. And then finally, invisible. Which, you know, it's just an invisible thing. It has no visible component whatsoever. So, it doesn't show up in video, it doesn't show up in photos, it doesn't show up to the naked eye, it doesn't ever show up. There's no smoke, there's nothing. So... If you combine all those things together, all those categories, its nature and its temperament, then you can see how that could result in a lot of different kinds of ghosts. Like having a tangible angry spirit, a tan tangible confused one, a tangible sad, tangible fearful, a tangible caring. And then combining all the you know, temperaments with all the other natures as well. So, a lot of possibilities for writing a different a lot of different kinds of ghosties. And you can tell what something is by, of course, physically seeing it. Like if you see a ball of light, however briefly, like if you just catch it just as it's happening, you go, oh, oh I saw it. That's a, 
uh, incorporeal ghost. And then you could see it like fling a uh, cup against the wall and go, oh, it's an angry one. So you have now two components to what the ghost is. And I was working on a third category, which would be quirks, because I was afraid that that would be too easy. Uh, like the second that you figure out, oh, it's probably angry and I can see it, it's smoke, then you know exactly what the ghost is, right? So I was trying to figure out a way to like break that down a little bit more. Um, so I may need another category, I might not, or I might just may need the examples to be more subtle than what they are, or I might need to have multiples in order to solidify it, or there might be some that are conflicting in some way. I don't know. Point, like, the point is, I'm working on it still. But that's what I've been doing. Plus, and this is where, finally, I will explain why... Ashlyn here is uh, in the video. I had the idea of I can include my own setting in the game. Like instead of it just being the real world and their ghosts and you got to fight the ghosts. I was thinking I could actually use my own ideas for a setting to explain this. And maybe even for fun include some of my own characters if I can actually get them in the game. Which I'm not too concerned about but it's possible. Uh, so in this universe, rather than them just being ghosts, I'm treating it as maybe I'll set it back in like something that is analogous to the 1970s or 1980s so that there's no internet and people are still having to use like typewriters and, uh, you know, uh, hand, you know, just no cell phones, no cell phones, that sort of thing. And... Because I prefer that setting when you're doing anything that's involving, like, spooky ghosties. Because it just makes it that much more spooky. Correct? Yes, I am correct. Um, and the ghosts... I had the idea of this is an era in which people have always known that ghosts exist because monsters exist. And they become a part of daily life, in a sense. Uh, there's not many of them. Like, this was part of the Scary Lessons universe. And here I am painting the lines. It's something I was trying to do in my last short, and then I forgot about it. And funny thing is, I finally do it after like an hour of working on it, and then I decide that I don't like it, and I get rid of it. <laughs> um, but in the Scary Lessons universe, the idea was that monsters can originate in a lot of different ways, but they all come from the same basic premise, in that if you guys know what a tulpa is or what an egregore is, they are effectively like entities that are created by willing them to exist, and that if lots of people believe that something is real, then it will eventually become real in some way. And I came up with this concept of Othelity, which is a word that means nothing to you guys, but if you were part of my Picardo days of just hanging out there before I had the Discord, uh, I did a lot of workshopping because this actually all began with the Saiyan women, if you remember them. I made them, and then I decided I want to make up a setting in which they exist, but they don't have to be like Saiyans. So I came up with this whole setting that had its own names, its own characters, and all these other things. And I came up with a power system, and that power system oriented around this idea. And whenever I came up with the Scary Lessons thing, I that it inherited all that. And the idea is the same. It's the more that the more that people believe something, the more strength that it has, the more merit it has. Um, so being able to like prove yourself is incredibly important. In the, the old, like, Saiyan girls, the Sonder uh, universe sort of thing. And in Scary Lessons, it works very similarly. In the sense of, where do, like, vampires come from? And the idea was, well, something happened a long time ago to one specific person that was very traumatic. And it involved something that was thematically appropriate to vampires at the time. And that is inevitably where... where that came from like one person turned into a vampire and from that you get like a family line of vampires in a sense it sort of works that way uh, 
So an ordinary person can turn into a ghost or a ghost can sort of just manifest out of nothing in some rare cases because enough people were just terrified of an area or enough people were or vilifying someone that didn't deserve it. And whenever they die, they left something behind, but it's not really them. And you just have to determine whether or not... You know, the, My original concept was you could even treat it like a murder investigation. This is why I was comparing it with, with uh, profiling. Um, and you had to figure out what happened to the ghost, but I thought, well, that's probably getting too complicated. So maybe just determining what the ghost... Like, if there was an actual, like, uh, investigative squad that was being developed, sort of like mine hunters, and here we go, final picture. Then this would, is what it would be. You would uh, hear a report of a ghost. You would send in your profiling squad to examine the location and figure out, oh, this is what the ghost type is, so that you can send up a containment team that would be the ones that actually take care of the ghost or relocate it or neutralize it in some way. And that would be one entire aspect to the whole there are monsters in the world sort of idea. Is that there are monsters and some of them are ghosts and this is just one subtype. And this is one way that people have been dealing with them. So there's also a narrative component that I wanted to include in some way, even if it's incredibly vague and even if it's only in item descriptions or whatever. So that's why Ashlyn is here. Because she was... Back in 2017, I did this little thing where I decided I'm going to go look at incredibly obscure monster girls, or not monster girls, just monsters from different parts of the world that no one's ever heard of, like Jinx and Bums or, uh, uh, what's another crazy one? Uh, S Wangs or like a Jackalope. Uh, people know what Jackalope is or, uh, uh, Bulk Bulgasari, and make monsters out of those. And I also did like sphinxes and a moth girl and a talipo, and I did all sorts of different things. And from those, that's where the scary lesson girls came from. Uh, people just really like some of those, and I decided, all right, I'll lift those and make them their own character. So by the time December rolled around, two months later, I came up with a scary lessons comic which was this setting where it was this hidden mansion deep in the Appalachians where it was privately funded by this mysterious figure that didn't want anything except to bring in young people, and in this case, uh, girls. I thought it would be like a divided campus or something. And um, basically just try to give them as good of a head start on life as they possibly could get by, uh, like, teaching them, like, higher-level education, and especially if they came from, like, broken homes, like, trying to get them back on their feet and reorient them with a more uh, positive, uh, like, life situation so that they could, you know, just have more resources to have a successful life. And that's very important for monsters because they're somewhat rare still, and they are uh, obviously something that are still feared by modern society, even though they become a little bit more commonplace or more accepted. It's sort of like a segregation thing, in a sense, of uh, this is one cultural problem that people are dealing with, and uh, there are people that are still resistant to it. So it's basically just a positive messaging platform. That was the whole idea behind it. And Ashlyn just so happened to be one of those ghosts. She is a sheet ghost. A classic, I'm afraid, like, you can imagine how a sheet ghost would originate. People are just terrified if sheets are blowing in the wind. <laughs> like, m m mainly she is a joke because sheet ghost, of course. Uh, but I could come up with a convoluted reason for why her ancestor existed, and therefore she started to exist as well. Because they, they are effectively still humans. They have, like, supernatural qualities about them, but they can still, you know, uh, live and eat and work and just do everything that people do and reproduce. <laughs> and uh, make more of themselves as a result. And there are rules behind what you get if you cross monsters and just... There's all sorts of things I could go over. But it's not that important. Point is, this is Ashlyn. This is why she exists. This is why I was drawing that picture. 
I will be making a short out of this as well that will be more structured and not so much me rambling, but I know that you guys like to listen to me ramble sometimes as well, because it's been a while. Okay, the end. That's the idea. I feel like I missed something, and I'm forgetting it, but probably not. Okay, hope you guys enjoyed yourselves. This is the drawing. It was a pain in the ass. Happy birthday to me. I've got to go renew my driver's license now. I'll see you guys next time. <laughs> Goodbye.